Scripture lesson for this morning is from the 8th chapter of Mark's Gospel, verses 11 through 21. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, he departed to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they discussed it with one another, saying, We have no bread. And being aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? May God bless to his hearing the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May be seated. Thank you, choir. If I had a choir like that, I'd go back into the parish. <laughs> Marilyn and I are happy to be with you here at St. John's this morning as you prepare to celebrate the 90th anniversary of worshiping in this historic sanctuary. Although we were with you for only a few short years, we continue to cherish the memories of friendships and our experiences here at St. John's and in the Rock Hill community. And I would say to you, you look great to me. I don't think I'm going to have my cataracts done after all. <laughs> Scripture lesson comes from the eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel. Here's an interesting account here. The chapter begins with the feeding of the 4,000, and then Jesus and his disciples set out by boat to go to another area. And during the trip, apparently at one of the stops along the shoreline, a group of Pharisees approached Jesus asking for, for some sign, which he rejects. And, and once again in the boat and alone with the disciples, Jesus warns them to beware of this unbelieving spirit of the Pharisees. And as they continue their trip, it's discovered that someone forgot to bring the provision of bread for the day. Bread, as you know, was a main part of the daily diet in Jesus' day. And right away, the disciples began to argue with one another as to who forgot to bring the bread, sort of like an episode of Family Feud. And Jesus looked into the faces of these 12 men, these disciples of his, and I suppose it was a look of both surprise and disappointment. And he says to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand? Do you not yet remember? The King James Version translates that last question, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? When those disciples who had enjoyed the intimate company of Jesus, those who had been privileged to all that he had said and done, began to argue over the lack of bread, Jesus asked them, Have you forgotten? I think that one of the deep spiritual needs of our day is to revive the importance and the power of memory. Memory is one of those special abilities which God has given us 
and I believe he intends it to have a spiritual purpose. Perhaps the most widespread and flagrant sin committed today is not some specific act of wrongdoing, though surely such abound, but it is rather for us as the people of God to reap the benefits of life as we have it and enjoy it today, to, to prosper in the goodness of God, and yet not to remember to be thankful, not remember to give God thanks for his goodness to us. That sin that we're all guilty of to one degree or another. I also think that one of the most accessible sources for the continuing revelation of God in our lives is memory. And yet it is one source that we rarely call upon. Few of us today give attention to anything except the, the immediate present, the long for future. Rarely do we reflect upon where we have come from and how our lives have been shaped by influences and sustained by the graciousness of other persons in our lives. This morning I would like to suggest for our reflection several important things which perhaps we have forgotten in the church and need to remember. First of all, have we forgotten that we stand today on the shoulders of those who came before us? Here at St. John's, you are preparing to celebrate the 90th anniversary of worshiping in the structure in which we are worshiping this morning. And as I look at this magnificent structure at the character of this structure, I am reminded that this is not the work of our hands. It is the work of hands other than ours, and it wasn't easy. I well remember sitting with Paul and Elizabeth Jenkins in, in the living room of their home on College Avenue and hearing Paul tell me about the day that the debt on this sanctuary was finally retired. Paul Jenkins was the treasurer of St. John's at that time. And that was a great day in the history of St. John's, even greater than it normally would have been because the debt on this building endured the Great Depression. Many places closed during that period. But St. John's survived because of its people and because of their commitment to their church. I do not believe in worshiping the past, but I do believe in honoring the past. Because without the past, there would be no present, and without the present, there would be no future. Today, this sanctuary is filled with our faces but it is crowded with the memory of other faces as well. Many, many other faces. Generations of other faces. They are our ancestors in faith and service. Have we forgotten that we stand today on the shoulders of those who came before us? Secondly, have we forgotten the heritage that is ours as Methodist? It's been said that when John Wesley died, he left four things. He left a silver spoon. He left a worn out clergyman's coat. He left a badly abused reputation and he left the Methodist movement. And what a movement it was. Some historians say that the Methodist movement saved England from the kind of revolution which took place in France. Methodism drew its life from two great rivers, from the majestic traditions of the Church of England and from the warm-hearted piety of the evangelical revival of the 18th century. Methodism was born as a people-centered, life-giving, soul-caring, but completely unofficial movement within the Anglican Church. As Methodists, we are heirs of the great traditions of the church in our Psalter, 
in our rituals, in our hymns, in our creeds, in our articles of religion, and in our book of worship. But we are also the heirs of another spirit and another tradition. For Methodism went where the established Church of England would not go. Methodism went to the prisons and to the tenements and to the slums and to the open fields of England. Methodism went where the people were who were the most in need. It went to forgotten people, neglected people. It went with a soul-saving message about the grace of God and the free gift of that grace in Christ being available to and for all people. When John Wesley decided to preach in the open fields of England, the entire future of the Methodist movement began to take definitive shape. The early Methodists did not have marble altars or great cathedrals. In many places, Methodism went to the wrong side of town, so to speak. But it went not with a lifeless formalism, but with the vitality of a living message about the love and the grace of God and the redemption that's available to every person through Christ, the embodiment of God's grace, regardless of status or position or class. The Methodists went everywhere with this message, it went across oceans, over mountains, into the wilderness of this land we called America. And here Methodism left an indelible mark upon the character of the nation. You know it was the first national church. Episcopalians don't like to hear me say that. But it was. It was the first national church. It was the first denomination organized in America. And it was organized four years before the Protestant Episcopal Church was organized in 1788. Our Episcopal friends have the National Cathedral in Washington, but that's all right. <laughs> because Methodists would, would have preferred to preach on the mall anyhow. <laughs> on the pedestrian, in the pedestal of the equestrian statue of Francis Asbury, which stands in Washington, D.C., are the words, if you seek for the results of his labors, you will find them in our Christian civilization. Have we forgotten the heritage that is ours as Methodists. And then third, the third thing, have we forgotten God's sustaining grace? That undeserved, unearned, unmerited love of God which constantly surrounds us, which at times confronts and constrains us, and which ultimately redeems us. Among the most persistent themes of the Bible is the story of man's unfaithfulness, but of God's faithfulness. There is in the, a verse in Deuteronomy, which I like very much, which says, And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you. The thing I like about that verse and what speaks to me about it is that it says, And you shall remember all the way all the way, not on the mountaintops alone, but in the valleys as well, not only through the easy times, but through the hard and difficult times, times of testing and trial and tribulation. There God is with us to lead us through as well. We need to remember that God has sustained us all the way with his love and grace. The God who called the children of Israel out of Egypt is the same God who led them through the wilderness. And how many times did that same God redeem and restore the nation in the face of its repeated infidelities? The Bible is the story of God's faithfulness. There's a story from the early days of the last century about a greatly beloved and admired professor at Emory College in Oxford, Georgia, named Dr. Edgar Johnson. Dr. Johnson also taught the Sunday school lesson there to the college students each Sunday. One day, his eight-year-old daughter became ill very quickly and died very unexpectedly. 
I think it goes without saying that nothing can so shatter the life of parents as the death of a child. The following Sunday, the message of the Sunday School lesson was this, in all things God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And the story is that Dr. Johnson stood before those college students that morning and said, the important words here are in all. I do not believe he said that you could take each and every single incident in your life and separate it out from the rest of your life and say that, that it by itself was for the glory of God or for your good. There are some experiences that hardly fall into that category, but God's overarching purpose is about us and over us. And when all of life has been lived and God finally puts together the end result, you will see that in it all, in it all, he has worked for his glory and for your good. Have we forgotten God's sustaining grace? And then fourth and finally, have we forgotten the great central certainties of our faith? Those timeless and deathless things which cannot perish because they are grounded in the eternal. You know, there's a tendency in religion to get lost sometimes out on the periphery to become caught up in things that don't really matter very much, to, to begin to sort of major in the minors. And all too often, I'm afraid to fall into the trap of only minoring in the majors. And this happens in the church. It's happening in the United Methodist Church now. In our efforts to embrace diversity, we lose sight of sometimes of the core of our central beliefs. What of the central things? What of the central certainties? The great central themes that are the foundation of the faith without which we quickly lose sight of meaning and purpose for our lives. To mention a few, a one the church is deathless. United Methodist Church may die one day, but not the church of Jesus Christ. That church is deathless. The kingdom is coming. Now, I know sometimes it doesn't seem to be coming very quickly or coming very well. Sometimes it seems that we are being, uh, we're losing ground rather than making progress. But it's coming, and it's coming in God's time, not in ours. There is life after death. One of the great affirmations of our faith, our belief in eternal life. Christ is sovereign for all the questions of life. Sin is a reality in our lives and in the life of the world. I know we don't like to mention sin, but it's there. And considering the events of the last week, if you don't think sin is alive in the world and you've missed the meaning of it all, we're justified by faith, not by works. The gospel is adequate for the needs of humankind. Th these are a few, only a few, but are these not among the great central certainties of our faith? Christ said, upon the rock of faith I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church may not endure in the exact form in which we know it today, but it will endure, and it will endure in the form in which God wants it to be. Yes, the church is crafted by our own hands, but it has an existence apart from us and one over which we do not have final or ultimate control. We live in an imperfect world, and we're constantly reminded of our own imperfections, but this world is ultimately God's, not ours, and he is not indifferent to it. He stands behind the forces of good. He works for the coming of his kingdom. 
He's alive, he is active, he is the ever-present power of forgiveness and redemption. In Christ, we have God's assurance and his promises of life beyond this life, that, that truth, though crushed to earth, shall rise again, that divine love, though crucified, shall have a resurrection. Could this faith we call Christianity have endured for over 2,000 years were it not the embodiment of divine truth, were it not God's work? We are not transients in a cruel world. We are indeed the children of God. But do we too often approach our world and the challenges which it presents with apology and fear rather than faith? Vital Christianity has always been characterized by its audacity and by its daring. Remember that the most glorious pages in the history of Christianity were written under the reign of governments whose purpose it was to destroy religion. Someone has written that uh, it is the intention of the gospel to conquer. It cannot conquer except in love, but in love it intends to conquer. As Ralph W. Sockman once wrote, why is it, why is it that 2,000 years after the Emperor Nero from his golden house put to death the itinerant evangelist Paul of Tarsus why is it that we're naming our sons Paul and our dogs Nero? Well, because this treasure that we have in earthen vessels is still the only treasure that can save the world. Because it's still better to see through the glass darkly than not to see it all. Because for all the imperfections of our world and for all our personal imperfections, we are not without hope. Because for all the difficulties that we must sometimes journey through in this world, we still have those glimpses of the kingdom of God and the promises of Christ. Because although we do not yet see everything in subjection to Christ, we do see Christ. James Russell Lowell wrote these words. Been a hymn in our hymnal a number of times. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet his truth alone is strong. Though her portion be the scaffold, and upon the throne be wrong, yet the scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Friends, I do not fear the future. My only fear is that we will not remember the past. Christ looked into the eyes of these well-meaning, these faithful disciples, and he said to them, why do you argue? over the fact that you have no bread? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not understand? Have you forgotten? Have we forgotten that we stand on the shoulders of others? Have we forgotten the heritage that is ours as Methodists? Have we for forgotten God's sustaining grace? Have we forgotten the great central certainties of our faith? Those things which are timeless and deathless because they are grounded in the eternal. May we pray. Divine Father, to whom all time is one. We thank you that our time is in thy hands, that underneath us and around us through all the days is thy love and thy grace and thy guiding spirit. 
in remembering, may we find strength and hope sufficient for each day. In the name and spirit of Christ, amen.